Good morning, everybody. Good morning to those people whose cameras are on. Good morning to these people whose cameras are off. Good morning who have muted their microphone. And good morning to those people who think they have muted and we still can hear them. And good morning to people like me who are still figuring out where the mute button is. Is everybody ready for this <laughs> workshop? The magic? Ready in the comment with your location. I am ready here. Type in. Wow, wow, good job. Thank you guys, thank you. Now, before I start, I would like to appreciate Abhi's hard work on making these workshops happen. One of the many side effects of being part of Toastmasters Club is that you get to see speeches which are funny, inspirational, and informative. But once in a while, once in a while, you get to see something that is thought-provoking, mind-bending, and life-altering. Today, we're going to see something like that. Please help me welcome our speaker, Stuart Murray. Stuart has moved from the old world center, London, to arguably the new technological world center, Bay Area. He has been a Toastmasters for a very long time and he received many awards during, during these years. He was He has won second place in the Evaluation and International Speech Contest this year. He won first prize in Evaluation Contest in 2017 for District 4. He was awarded the Toastmaster of the Year in 2017 in District 4. Please help me welcome our speaker today, Stuart Murray, for the magic of mindset. Thank you very much, Ravi, for that very kind introduction. And thank you also to Abi for setting up this workshop. It's a great privilege to be here to talk to you today about mindset. It may be mind bending, it may be mind altering, but at least I hope that by the end of this, you'll have a little bit of something to think about when it comes to your own mindset. Now, we're doing this by Zoom today, of course. Normally when I do workshops like these, I try to do them in person, uh, so there can be a lot of interaction with the audience. We'll do the best we can over Zoom, and in fact, I invite you to participate as best you can, and there are a couple of things that you might want to do. First, please do ask any questions that you have as you go along using the chat feature in Zoom. Abi will keep we'll keeping an eye on those, and periodically we'll have a chance to stop and answer questions along the way. And hopefully there'll also be a little bit of time at the end to answer any questions that we didn't get to. And secondly, uh, there'll be opportunities for you to do a little bit of uh, work yeah, from answering some of my stuff. questions. Um, there'll be some exercises to do. So you may want to have a pen and paper handy or uh, uh, some notes open on your computer. And that way you'll hopefully get the most that you can out of this workshop. So as I said, today we're gonna be talking about mindset. And I'd like to start with actually a story about a man named Ernest Jones. This is him here. He was a British golfer in the early 20th century. In fact, one of the most successful golfers of his generation. At the age of 25 in 1913, he was made the head professional golfer of his local golf club. And 10 years later, he was made the head professional golfer at the Women's National Golf and Tennis Club in New York City. And that's a position he held for over 35 years. He himself won several tournaments a player, but he was perhaps even more respected as a teacher and a coach, with many of his students going on to win championships themselves. So by any measure, you might say that Ernest Jones was a very successful person, a very successful golfer. 
but there's something that you need to know about Ernest Jones. And that is that he only had one leg. He lost his other leg fighting as a soldier in the First World War as a young man. Now, I play golf a little bit, and I can tell you that I have two functioning legs that work perfectly well, and I'm terrible at golf. So imagine what it must be like to have to completely relearn your own sport, your own profession, after losing a leg. And imagine what it must take to be even more successful after that than you were before. So let me ask you a question. When you think of Ernest Jones, how would you describe him? What words, what adjectives would you use if you were to describe Ernest Jones? Why don't you type them into chat? Come up with uh, just a few words and let's see what you, let's see what words you would use to describe it. Okay, let's see, headstrong, yeah, dedicated, resolute, passionate, determined, resilient, tenacious. Yeah, I think those are all great adjectives, absolutely. I came up with a few. Um, Ernest, <laughs> it's right there in his name, what a surprise. Uh, determined, gritty, resolute, uh, driven, resilient, persevering, stubborn. Um, absolutely, all of these words are very appropriate in describing Ernest Jones. Now let me talk about another individual, a young man. And this young man was, he was pretty smart, I suppose, but he never really did that well in school. He's kind of middle of the pack. And the sorts of things that his teachers would write in his report card had a common theme. They would say things like, well, he has ability, but he really must work harder, or he gives up too easily when he struggles. He was very good in some subjects, like music and science, but he did really badly in others, like art and history. Whenever he got a good grade, he would pat himself on the back and say, wow, I'm really good at this. Whenever he got a bad grade, he would say, well, it's not my fault. I had a bad teacher or... The textbooks weren't very good. He had lots of hobbies as a child, but he never stuck with any of them for very long. As soon as he got, as soon as he struggled or found something difficult, he would just give up and move on to the next thing. It's so boring, he might say. This is just too much work. Whenever his friends would do something good, he would feel jealous. He would say, wow, they're so lucky. They have so much talent. I wish I was as lucky as they were. So again, I ask you, what sort of words might you use to describe this individual? What sort of adjectives? Type them into the chat. Confident, interesting, scared, ignorant, <laughs> like me, says Dan. Intelligent, underperforming, young without guidance, could be true for sure. A dreamer, mm -hmm. could be, not clear, yeah. These are great, here, I mean, here are some of the ones that I came up with. Uh, pessimistic, maybe, a bit of a defeatist, someone who gives up easily, I think I mentioned that. No drive, uh, easily discouraged, dropout perhaps is another word you might use. The point is that this young man and Ernest Jones are really two quite different people in some ways. And so my question for you is, when do these differences show up? At what points in their lives do we see the differences between these two individuals most clearly? Think back to their stories. At what points would you say that their character really came into the spotlight? Does anyone have an idea they could type into chat? Well, for me, I think the time when you see the difference most clearly is when each of them faced a setback, some kind of challenge, some kind of struggle, some kind of difficulty. Ernest Jones persevered relentlessly, even when facing one of the most devastating setbacks that anyone can experience, never mind a professional athlete. The young boy, on the other hand, when he was faced with a challenge or a difficulty or a setback, he just kind of gave up. He never really persevered 
at all. He preferred to take the easy path. And so really for me, the big difference between these two individuals is their mindset, which is what this whole workshop, of course, is about. We're going to be talking about our mindsets and in particular, how our mindsets come into play when we face difficulties or challenges or setbacks, because that's when we really need to know what kind of mindset we have. So we'll talk about ways we can figure out what our mindsets are, and then we'll talk about some ways we could change our mindset if we don't like how it affects us in the moment, and then maybe even how we can keep that mindset that we want going forwards over the long term. All right, before we get to all of that, I have another little exercise for you, and it's this. I'd like you to spend a minute, a minute or so to think about one or two things that you've always wished you could do, but either you just figure you can't do it or you tried it once and just kind of gave up, or maybe you just feel like you're not talented or skillful enough to do it. Maybe it's learning a new language. Maybe it's learning to play an instrument. Maybe you want to think about starting your own business or something like that. Have a thought, have a think about that. And then just write them into chat, chat and use this format. I cannot do something. I cannot draw, I cannot sing, I cannot play an instrument. Um, just type those into chat right now and see, see what we've got. I cannot program. <laughs> okay. Programming is, uh, is, uh, is always hard. There's always something, it, it moves so fast. Such a fast moving landscape. Cannot play guitar, cannot stick to one thing. I understand that for sure. I cannot do what I think I can't. I cannot swim, okay. I cannot run my own business, cannot control my brain, uh-huh. Okay, these are good. Hang on to these. We'll be coming back to these throughout this workshop. You'll actually be spending a little bit more time working on this. For me, it was drawing. That was one of the things that I couldn't do. Uh, if it wasn't already clear, that young boy that I talked about uh, earlier on, that's me, uh, that was me as a child. Um, and one of the things I just was no good at was drawing. I had no talent for it. Uh, clearly, by the work that I produced, my teachers all told me that I was terrible at it. And so pretty quickly, I gave up on it, and I just stopped trying it. Um, and a little bit more recently, uh, I decided to try again just to see what I was like. And this is a portrait that I drew of myself, if you could believe it. Um, this was not the work of a five-year-old, but of a 35-year-old. And uh, this, is, this is my uh, skill at drawing, such as it was back when I drew, it, drew this picture. Then one day, I was browsing through a bookshop and I came across a book that just stood out to me for reasons I still don't really know. It was just, I saw it on the shelf. And it's not an exaggeration to say that this book completely changed my life. In fact, I would not be standing here talking to you right now if I had not picked up that book and read it. And that book is called Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards. And the reason this book was so important to me, the reason that it changed my life, is because Betty Edwards taught me to do something that I knew for a fact was impossible. She taught me how to draw. This is also a picture that I drew after reading her book, and yes, after putting in a lot of time and practice. And I want to make it clear that I have not discovered a new talent. I have no more talent for drawing now than before. But what Betty Edwards did, apart from teaching me the skill of drawing, what she really did was she changed my mindset. And the concept of mindset that we're going to be talking about comes from a psychologist from Stanford, pretty local, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck. And she has spent her career trying to understand how people handle failure. And in her book, Mindset, The New Psychology of Success, she describes that generally we find ourselves in one of two different mindsets, either a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. And it's when we face setbacks that our mindset determines how we handle them. Just like with Ernest Jones, just like with me growing up, it's our mindset that determines what happens when we face a challenge. When we have a fixed mindset, we believe that our basic human characteristics, 
things like our intelligence or our talents or our skills or even some of our personal qualities like integrity or work ethic, we believe that they are fixed, that they are set in stone from birth and they cannot be changed. And this is how Dr. Carol Dweck describes it. She says that a fixed mindset creates an urgency to prove ourselves over and over. That every situation calls for confirmation of our intelligence or our personality or our character. That every situation will be evaluated based on, you know, will I succeed or fail? Will I look smart or dumb? Will I be accepted or rejected? Will I feel like a winner or a loser? How many of you have ever had thoughts like that come into your head at some point? Type into chat if that resonates you, with you. I mean, it certainly has with me. I've certainly felt or thought some of those things several times. Yeah, I mean, pretty much everyone does. I think at some point in their lives, they start to worry about these sorts of things. And the problem is that fixed mindset can lead to a whole bunch of undesirable behaviors. For example, when we have a fixed mindset, we tend to avoid challenges. If it will make us look bad, we tend to give up easily. We tend to avoid asking questions or asking for help. We can become threatened by the success of other people. We tend to avoid criticism or when we do get it, we may just ignore it. We celebrate winning over trying, over outcome instead of effort. We become overly concerned with how other people see us. And we tend to have negative backwards looking thoughts. Oh man, my life would have been so different if only, or I wish I'd been born with, or if only I had grown up with this. And that's a lot of negativity to be associated with. And the big problem is that if you fundamentally believe that you cannot change or grow in any way, then you also believe that of other people around you. And if no one can grow or change, then nothing ever will get better. And that, for me, is just a very depressing thought. On the other hand, if we have a growth mindset, we do not believe that our qualities and abilities are fixed and set in stone. We believe that they can change over time. This is how Dr. Dweck describes it. The growth mindset is based on the belief that your basic qualities are things you can cultivate based on your efforts. Although people differ in every which way, everyone can grow through application and experience. The passion for stretching yourself and sticking to it, even or especially when it's not going well, is the hallmark of a growth mindset. This is the mindset that allows people to thrive during some of the most challenging times in their lives. So again, going back to Ernest Jones, going back to my own story as a child, it's when we face challenges and setbacks that our mindset really comes into play. And when we have a growth mindset, well, things tend to change. We tend to have a better attitude towards life. We embrace challenges because we no longer see it as a reflection of ourselves. We're more likely to persevere through duties. We're more likely to ask questions, to seek help from other people. We're more likely to seek out criticism and incorporate the feedback that we hear. We're more likely to celebrate the success of others, even if it doesn't reflect on us. We're more likely to celebrate trying over winning, effort over outcome. We focus more on how we see ourselves rather than on how other people might see us. And we tend to have positive forward-looking thoughts, thinking about the future and what that holds for us. When we have a growth mindset, failure is an obstacle that we have to overcome. It's not a permanent roadblock that we can never get around. And in fact, often it spurs us on to want to try harder, to keep going, because we want to prove that we can get over that obstacle. And really for me, a growth mindset allows us to believe in ourselves. And if we can believe in ourselves, then that allows us to believe in others as well. And that just seems like a much more optimistic state of mind to be in. So it's important to note that our mindsets exist on a spectrum and are situational. It depends on the context we're in. We might find ourselves with more of a fixed mindset in some contexts or situations and more of a growth mindset in others, for example, 
somebody might say to themselves, well, uh, I have a fixed mindset about intelligence. I'm terrible at mathematics. I've always been bad at math. I'll never be any good at math. But on the other hand, they may say, well, actually, that same person could say I've, I've grown in, as a public speaker. Um, after all, think about this. You're all in Toastmasters. And whatever you think of your mindset right now, the fact that you join Toastmasters means that deep down inside you somewhere, you believe that you can grow. You believe that you can get better as a public speaker, as a communicator, or as a leader. And I bring this up because it's important to realize that when you have a growth mindset in, other, in some areas, that you can, you can think about that when you're struggling. You can reference it. You can, like, you can lean into your growth mindset when you find yourself struggling with some other part of your life where you believe you have a, a fixed mindset. Okay. Stuart, there is a Hopefully. question. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Oh. Nagaraj is saying he has both mindsets at the same time. What should he do? Well, we'll talk about that because, um, like I said, it is situational and you can have a bit of one mindset or the other. Uh, so just in a few minutes, we're actually going to talk about how you can focus on developing that growth mindset. So we'll get to this in a second. So hopefully, at least I've convinced you that a growth mindset is probably a good thing to have. And so perhaps as Nag and other people are wondering, what does it take to change a mindset? Or how can I develop a growth mindset? If that's what I want. Well, the first thing you have to do is evaluate where you are, try and figure out what kind of mindset you have at the moment. And one really good way of doing that is to pay attention to language. And I mean, really, Pay attention to the, the words, the inner monologue in your head. What kind of words are you using to describe yourself at that moment? That's why I started this workshop talking about the words we might use to describe Ernest Jones or the, the young boy, because those words are a good indicator of where our head currently is. So let's have a quick, uh, a quick game of guess the mindset. I'm gonna show you some statements or some phrases, and I just want you to type into chat Fixed, if you think it's a statement that reflects a fixed mindset, or growth, if you think it's a statement that reflects a growth mindset. Or if you just want to do it quickly, F for fixed, G for growth. All right, here we go. Type into chat. Uh, you can't change who you are. Is that a statement for a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? F for fixed, yeah, absolutely, of course it is. Life is so unfair. Oh, man, life sucks. Why is it so, why is it so unfair to me? Fixed, growth, yeah, pretty much a fixed mindset. What about this one? How can I improve? Fixed or growth, fixed or growth. Yeah, it's a growth mindset, absolutely. Seeking to, to improve yourself. Can you help me? Yep, absolutely. Growth, asking for help is a clear sign of a growth mindset. This always happens to be fixed. Yep, <laughs> you folks are doing really well at this. This is gonna be a great challenge. Fixed or growth, fixed or growth. Yeah, that's a growth mindset. People embrace challenges. I'll never figure this out. Fixed or growth, fixed or growth. Yep, that's definitely fixed. This is hard, but not impossible. Yep, growth mindset for sure. I'm a failure. Yeah, that was pretty much a fixed mindset. I'll keep trying till I get it right. Growth mindset. Yeah, not so difficult, right? You pay attention to the words and you start to see pretty clearly what kind of mindset that you have. So that's the first step. Be aware of your own inner monologue. Pay attention to the words that you are using to describe where you are at that moment. Okay, I'll pause there to see if there are any other questions, Abi. Nothing much right now. All right, very good. Uh, this is me, so, I have a question. Go ahead, Ming. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, somehow you fix mindset have its own advantage too, because sometimes we say you're too stubborn Another time we say you have a deep conviction. So how do you juggle with the two different per perception about fixed mindset? Well, so I say that the, the idea of being stubborn or determined isn't necessarily a reflection of fixed or growth mindset. Remember the, the, the real distinction between fixed and growth mindset is whether you believe that you can grow and change. So, if you are stubbornly clinging to the idea that you cannot change, then sure, I would call that 
a fixed mindset and probably not a useful thing. If on the other hand, you're stubbornly persevering towards achieving something, whether or not that's the right thing that you should be doing, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on, but stubbornly sticking to trying to make progress on something, I would argue is actually a sign of a growth mindset. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. All right. So how would you go about changing your mindset then going from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset? Well, again, let's focus on the language that we use and the words that we use. If you don't like the words that are running through your inner monologue, then what happens if you just change the words that you use? Is it that simple? Perhaps, maybe it is. In fact, there's one word in particular that I find really helpful when I find myself having those fixed mindset thoughts. And it's one word that opens up the door of possibility. It makes something that seems impossible in the moment seem possible again. And that one word is yet. It's just that simple. I can't draw yet. You could apply it to anything. I can't sing yet. I didn't get a job yet. I didn't get the promotion yet. I don't, ha I don't have my DTM yet. I can't swim yet. So try it for yourselves right now. Go back to that thing that you typed in earlier, that thing you wanted to do, but you don't think you can. I cannot blank. And then just add the word yet to it. Type it into chat now. I cannot program yet. Exactly. Perfect. I cannot play guitar yet. I, exactly. I cannot swim yet. Perfect. Love it. I can't stick to one thing yet. Sure. If that's what you want to do, sticking to one thing, then yes, you can't do it yet, but maybe you can in the future. I cannot learn a new language yet. Exactly. So do you see how powerful that one word can be? How it can take you from a, a mindset where things are just impossible and it opens a door to a future where you believe that Maybe you can achieve that thing that you've always thought was beyond you. If you change your words, you can start to change your mindset. Now, it's important, of course, to say that this doesn't fix everything. Like that one word doesn't wave the magic wand that suddenly makes all your dreams come true. As I said, all it does is really open the door and start you thinking in a slightly different way. You still have to do the hard work. You still have to walk through that door and then take the steps it, it needs that are necessary in order for you to achieve what it is that you want to achieve. And in order, in order to do that, there's something else that you'll need. And that is grit. Grit. This is a word you may have heard, um, but I'm going to talk about a specific uh, interpretation of it which actually comes from another psychologist uh, from San Francisco, in fact, originally, Dr. Angela Duckworth. And much like Carol Dweck, uh, Dr. Duckworth has spent her career trying to figure out what it is that makes people more likely to succeed. And in all of her research, she found that there was one personality trait in particular that was most commonly associated with successful people, and that is grit. And she defines it as this. Grit is our passion and perseverance for long-term goals. And she says, goes on to say that to be gritty is to keep putting one foot in front of the other. To be gritty is to hold fast to an interesting and purposeful goal. To be gritty is to invest day after week after year in challenging practice. To be gritty is to fall down seven times and rise eight. And yes, you can grow your grit. See, being gritty isn't glamorous. It's not magic. There's no special trick to it. It's simply making the choice to try every day, one day at a time, even when things are tough and not going well, make the choice to try and make some progress. And reinforcing what Carol Dweck says, like all of our personal traits, if you have a growth mindset, you believe that your grittiness can also grow. We all have different amounts of grit at different times, but all of us can develop more of it. In other words, 
you can say to yourself, I don't have grit yet, just like everything else. It's perfect. And so growth and grit go really well together. They, they reinforce and support each other. And the reason that's true is because they both show up at the same time. That is when you're struggling. Remember, when you have a fixed mindset and you face a challenge or a failure, if you have a fixed mindset, you're, you're discouraged from trying again. But with a growth mindset, you believe that you can succeed. At least you want to try. That failure is a chance to learn and an opportunity to, to keep going. And it's the grit that will make you take that next step. That will make you take another step, even if you feel like things aren't going well. And when you overcome that challenge, when you do make that little bit of progress, that reinforces the growth mindset. It tells yourself, hey, see, you convinced yourself to try again and it's working. And that's more likely to make you take another step, which then reinforces your growth mindset, which then makes you want to take another step and back and forth and back and forth. And so these two concepts for me are really powerful together, growth mindset and having this gritty attitude. But for it to work really, it needs to be properly channeled. It needs to be directed in the right way. And to do that, you need to have goals. That was part of Angela Duckworth's definition, the passion and perseverance for achieving long-term goals. But it's not enough to just have any goals. You need to have what I call purposeful goals. So let's spend a few minutes just talking about purposeful goals. Well, before we get to purposeful goals, let's just start with a regular goal. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with goals. You probably have to set them in your own work life. Maybe some of them, some of you have personal goals as well. And the most important thing about a goal is that it is uh, specific. That is, you have a specific thing that you're trying to achieve. That it is measurable, so you know whether or not you have achieved it. And that it's time bound, that you have some kind of deadline that you want to have it done by. So in other words, you know exactly what you want to achieve. You can tell precisely when you have achieved it and you have given yourself a time limit for doing so. And so for me, a goal might look like this. By Thanksgiving, I want to draw a recognizable portrait. Well, that's good, right? It's specific. I want to draw a recognizable portrait. It's measurable. I can show a portrait to somebody. If they recognize who it is, I've succeeded. And it's time bound by Thanksgiving. So that's like six or seven weeks away. So it seems like a reasonable goal. It's not yet, however, a purposeful goal. We'll get to that shortly, but it's a good start. So now over to you. I want each of you to either on a piece of paper or into the chat, if you feel like it, write down a specific goal in this format for the thing that you want to do. By some date, I want to achieve some specific thing. And don't worry too much about whether it's realistic or exactly how you're gonna get there. I just want you to be thinking about goals in this way. So start uh, by writing those out into chat if you would like. If you want to be a CEO, when would you like to be a CEO by? If you want to learn a language, what language do you want to learn? And when do you want to have it learned by? Okay, by the end of this month, I want to complete my application essays. That's great. Complete the essays. You can tell whether you've done it or not, and you're giving yourself a month. Perfect. I want to program in Python by the end of the year. Absolutely. That's great. So specific examples of things you want to achieve, and you can tell when you've done them, and you have a deadline for yourself. All right. So what about purposeful goals then? Well, to get there, I want you to do a little bit of digging. And I want you to add something, in fact, to the end of your goal. And it's this, because, and then the reason why. And the reason is really important, actually, maybe even more important than the goal itself, because the reason is where you find your motivation. When things get tough, your why is going to provide the motivation for you to continue. Uh, Viktor Frankl said this, those who have a why can bear almost any how. In other words, when you know why it is you're doing something, you're more likely to persevere and to continue. And so having a, a why, a because at the end of your goal makes it purposeful, gives your goal purpose. So for example, I want to learn to draw 
and I want to draw a portrait. Fine. That sounds like a nice goal, but why? Why is that important? Well, the reason is because actually I wanted to be a designer. And so now I have a reason. Drawing isn't just something I want to do because it's because it's leading me to something I want to become, which is a designer. So this is a purposeful goal. It's specific, it's measurable, it's time bound, and it has a why, it has a purpose, a reason. So now go back to your goals, the ones that you just wrote down, and add a why. Why is it that that particular goal is important for you? What's it going to allow you to do? What is it going to allow you to become if you achieve it? Type those into chat. Abi wants to program Python by the end of the year. Why? What's, what's going to be useful to Abi about learning to program in Python? If you want to complete a certificate by the end of the month, why? What is that certificate going to allow you to do that you couldn't do before? Aha, that's a great one from Nancy. By next year, I want to have a basic fluency in Spanish to be able to communicate with Graciela directly. Wonderful, being able to communicate with someone. That sounds like a pretty powerful goal, a uh, pretty powerful why. Right, for completing application essays by the end of the month so that they can go back to grad school because you can use it for your work. Exactly, so now you're starting to think about the reasons why you want to do something. Well, guess what? You don't stop there, you keep going. Let me explain what I mean. You know, the reason that I wanted to become a designer is because I saw my own mother, whose birthday it is today, she's 85 today, happy birthday mom. I saw my own mom struggling so much with technology, whether it was a microwave or a TV or a new computer or her car, it just seemed that technology was a real struggle for her. And the more I looked around, the more I saw other people struggling too. And I love technology. I mean, I, I was a software engineer out of college and I was making technology that other people were struggling to use. And that was upsetting to me. So I wanted to try and fix that. So that's the reason that I wanted to become a product designer. Because I want to make technology accessible to everyone. But then I can keep going. Why is it important for me to make technology accessible to everyone? What's driving that? Well, because really I want the world to struggle less. I want there to be less pain and frustration in the world. And so that is a pretty big why. That is a powerful motivator for me. In fact, you could say that I've built my entire career, maybe even my entire life around trying to achieve that big goal of making the world suck less for people. And so now I can draw a straight line for me learning to draw to some much bigger goal and that big or that, that, yeah much bigger goal that big goal is really going to provide me with a lot of motivation so that's really what a purposeful goal is angela duckworth says that it, it can be helpful to think about goals as being part of a hierarchy with smaller goals leading to bigger goals leading to bigger goals and that one big goal at the top that's your life purpose. That's your calling in the world. It drives everything you do. It's your reason to exist. And so as you get further to the top of that goal hierarchy, you're digging deeper and deeper into, your, into the why, why it is that things are important to you. And as I said, all of this is because it provides more motivation. The bigger the goal, the bigger the why, the more motivated you are likely to be the more likely you are then to succeed. In other words, this is where grit comes from. The bigger the why, the grittier you'll be, the more determined you'll be. And there's another interesting thing about looking at goals in this sort of hierarchy. You can see there that there are some spaces, places where you, a goal could fit in. And this actually turns out to be a pretty powerful thing because you can go the other way. Once you have that big life purpose, then you can start to think about all the other things in your life that would lead to it. And those things at the lower level could be really diverse. There are lots of ways 
that you can achieve your higher purpose. And so having a goal hierarchy like this can help you figure out how all the different things you do in your life fit together, what they all lead up to, what they, why they're all important to you. And it also provides another important purpose, which is that it gives you a chance to reflect on whether or not you should be spending your time doing certain things. For example, maybe there's a new thing that I want to do. Maybe I want to go learn the violin. I think it'd actually be pretty cool to be able to play the violin. But when I look at my goal hierarchy, I have to ask myself, how does that fit? Does it help me achieve my life purpose? After all, there's only so much time in the day. We only have so much energy to expend. And so being able to really think about whether or not we're spending our time achieving the things that are really important to us is an important part of staying on track, staying motivated and achieving our goals. And so deciding what not to do is really just as important as deciding what we are going to do. So these goals, especially when you have them in a hierarchy like this, give you a lot of clarity and purpose, which makes it much more likely that you'll then succeed and, uh, and stay motivated when things get tough. And so when you spend your time thinking about things in this way, that's really a good sign of a growth mindset. Remember earlier I said that a growth mindset is about looking forwards, not backwards. And so when you have a big goal like this that you're all striving towards, that's gonna help keep you pointed forwards, looking forwards, thinking about how you're gonna get there. Okay, um, we're pretty close to the end. I just wanna pause and see if there are any questions so far. No questions yet. Anyone okay. is welcome to ask any questions if they have. Stuart, yeah, you please type, type thank you so much. Oh yeah. You got us thinking so much. We don't have too many questions. We are all <laughs> thinking. <laughs> That's good. Keep thinking. Um, okay. So getting back to our, our goals, I want you to spend a minute just thinking about your goals a little bit more deeply. So, so start to think about them um, and ask yourself why. You know, a lot of you probably have done the five whys where you just keep asking why every time. Uh, just take a second to do that now. Go back to your goal by whatever you want to do, something specific because, and then you gave yourself a reason. See if you can come up with a couple more reasons, at least one, maybe two more reasons that are even bigger. Um, you know, if Abi wants to learn to program Python because it'll help him in his work, well, what does that lead to for you, Abi? Where's that gonna take you? How does that help you with some bigger goal? If you want to learn to speak Spanish so you can communicate with someone, What's that gonna to lead to? Perhaps that's gonna to lead to an improved relationship. Perhaps that's gonna lead you to have more balance in your life when it comes to your personal relationship. So start to think about these in a little bit more detail. Stuart, there's a question. Mm -hmm. How did you land up at your calling? How do people do that? <laughs> uh, that is a really good question. Um, I don't know, honestly. I can tell you that it wasn't purposeful in the sense that it's not like, um, the place I ended up uh, sort of appeared to me after I spent time thinking about it. it. You know, I certainly wasn't one of those people who left college having my whole life planned out. I really only had the next step planned out. Um, but I suppose at the time, I, I probably thought that that was, you know, I'd, but, you know, as a, as a naive 23 year old or whatever I was when I left college, I probably thought I had life figured out by that point. Of course, really didn't. Um, and so I, I don't really have a good answer other than to say, for me at least, it kind of came to me um, only after I spent a lot of time thinking about it and uh, realizing that um, I was frustrated with, um, with what I saw around me. Like I didn't like what I was seeing around me and I wanted to see what I could do to change it. Um, and I suppose a lot of people feel that way at some point. Um, you know, maybe it's earlier for some people, maybe it happens later for others, but uh, I, that's probably the best answer I can give. I think it's a fascinating question though. If anyone else, by the way, has any thoughts on this, um, whether it's because of things you've read, other workshops you've attended, then please do type those into chat. Uh, I'm here to learn as much as I am 
to tell you what I've learned. So please do share what you have with your colleagues in the chat. Uh, hello, uh, this is Ming again. I really enjoy Hi, Ming. your hello. I really enjoy Hi. your uh, talk. That is excellent. I really helped me greatly. I have a question for you. You know, our nation is in turmoil. One of the major things is we seem to fail to communicate with each other. How do you advise us to have a growth mindset to engaging in a meaningful conversation and to understand each other? That's a great question. Thank you, Ming. Uh, yes, I think there are a lot of parallels um, between having a growth mindset and being able to develop empathy for other people. And the root of it is listening, which is something that, of course, you can practice in Toastmasters. Uh, but really listening and turning off as best you can whatever preconceived notions you have about someone else. Um, and just being genuinely curious about what they have to say and why they're saying it. I mean, whether or not they've thought about it, they probably have their own hierarchy of goals too. They probably have their own ideas which lead to some grander and bigger thing. And I think that oftentimes we get so focused on, on the small details of life that we, we forget about the bigger details. And it wouldn't surprise me, even if someone has very different values from you, once you start to go up the hierarchy of those goals, of those values really is what they represent, you'll probably find that you have a lot more in common than maybe you, you might seem to have if you just pay attention to the small stuff. So that's really the best answer I can have for that. I think it's, I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch of the imagination and it can be really hard to stop and listen to someone who's saying things that seem to be so opposed to what you believe. But if you really listen and if you have the opportunity to ask them honestly with an open mind about why they think the things they do, you may start to see that they're perhaps not that different and you have more in common with them than you thought and that maybe um, there's a difference in, in approach um, and a difference in philosophy, but um, not necessarily that they're a, a, you know, a bad person or something like that. Does that make sense? Thank you, very helpful. Uh, Kieran shared, oh, Passion Planner, I haven't seen that. I will check that out after this, after this talk. That looks really cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. Stuart, there is one more question from Meena. Mm -hmm. What if your goal is based on something that is partly out of your control, like getting a job or interpersonal relationships, or ultimately mm -hmm. it's not 100% of you if someone wants to hire you, or it may depend on the job market? Sure. Oh. That, and that... Yep, go on. How do you preserve and maintain a growth mindset through seeking something that is partly out of your control? Yeah, that's also a really good question. Uh, of course, there are many things in our lives that we don't have control over. Um, I think it is uh, Stephen Covey maybe talks about this in, um, in his Effective Habits uh, books. Um, yeah, we have, we have a sphere of influence in our life. There are things that we have direct control over, the things that we can directly uh, alter or change, which is actually a pretty small bubble in our entire lives. The vast majority of the stuff that affects us, we cannot really control. The only thing we can control is how we respond to those situations, right? And so, I mean, you're asking, how do we stay positive or how do we keep a growth mindset when perhaps um, we rely on other people to do things for us. Well, the truth is that um, all you can do is, is choose to react in a way that moves you forward. So, uh, you know, I, I sometimes see on, uh, on social media um, people talking about their job search, for example, and they'll talk about, you know, the hundreds of applications that they sent out. And of those hundreds of applications that they sent out, maybe only 10 ever actually got a call from someone at the company. And of those, only three got an interview. And of those, you know, one maybe gave them an offer, or maybe none. But the point is that they chose then to just keep trying. And if you have that growth mindset and you feel that it will work for you, 
then ask others for help. Ask others for help in keeping you uh, on track with your goals. Ask for others to help you uh, evaluate your interviewing skills or to help you with your resume. Uh, you could even ask, and I've tried this in the past with my own job search, and usually it doesn't work. But again, perseverance is all about trying, even if you face failure. Try asking the people at the company that, that you haven't had success with, why? What is it about your interview? What is it about your resume that, that didn't work? Um, and if you do that a hundred times, maybe you only receive a response once, but that's, you still keep going, right? You still have to keep that mindset of, I'm gonna keep trying and I'm gonna keep trying and I'm gonna keep trying. Um, and also being open to the feedback and the criticism that you might get along the way, because that's gonna help you realize if there's a better way of doing things. Okay, um, we're close to the end of this, but I just want to finish up with um, sort of the final step here. Now that you've had a chance to think about your goals and certainly you, know, you can spend more time doing this in your own time outside of this workshop, uh, but you've, you've kind of gone up the goal hierarchy to a big why, or you're on the way to getting to that point. But in practical terms, as Angela Duckworth says, you have to take a step every day. You have to keep trying every day to achieving those goals. And so now what I want you to do is to think about two or three or four things that you could do today or tomorrow to help make progress towards your goal. And so, you know, when I was learning to draw, you know, I started by reading the book and then I practiced drawing a finger. Actually, it was the first thing that I drew. And then a whole hand and then a face and then a whole head and then the head and the shoulders and then the hat and then all the other things. And so the steps that I could take that moved me closer towards my big goal, right, of becoming, learning to draw so I could become a designer so I could make the world suck less. And even those daily things like practicing to draw, you could break those down, of course. You know, you could um, read 10 pages of a book every day. You could spend one hour practicing your drawing every day. You could even go smaller and use something like the Pomodoro technique to break up, you know, your, your one or two hours into, you know, three or four smaller chunks. But the point is to be thinking about little steps that you can take every day that will move you closer to your goal. Of course, you don't know what all those steps are yet, but you probably have some idea of the first two or three or four steps that you can take. So in the chat, your final exercise is to write down what you think the next step that you're gonna take. Either, like I say, today, when you get home from work, wait, you're already home from work, after work, or, you know, tomorrow, you've got the weekend. What could you do over the weekend to help you make progress towards your goal? So type those into chat. Let's see what your weekends are gonna be filled with, what little steps you're gonna take. Stuart, there is a question. Mm -hmm. Is this model restricted to one life purpose? To only great, one life? Great question. Um, that is a challenge. And uh, Dr. Duckworth actually talks about this in her book a little bit. She talks about the conflict that she's had trying to figure out if there is such a thing as multiple life purposes, um, if they can coexist. And she uses the example of her career, which she has a very well designed set of goals for, the, the things she wants to do in her career, but also her family. You know, she's a mother, she has ch children, and those are a conflicting set of needs. And she herself, at least uh, in the book, as it was written a few years ago, hadn't yet resolved that. And so she basically said, yes, Really, I have two life purposes. One is a career purpose, and one is a, is a family purpose. And I haven't yet really figured out what, if anything, is above those two. But I think it's worth thinking about, right? Like, what does it mean to have two life purposes, if that's the point you get to? And then what does it mean if, it, what, what is it that's above both of those things? I think that's an interesting question. Okay, let's have a look. So some people in the chat saying, uh, yeah, log into Duolingo every day. Practice 15 minutes a day. Perfect. Exactly. And there's, you know, there's a lot of talk about, um, and again, uh, Dr. Duckworth's book goes into this, but this is probably something you've heard, the idea of doing deliberate practice. You know, not just doing practice for the sake of it, 
but having a goal for the practice that you're doing and making sure that you are uh, focusing your efforts on improving in some way, not just going through the motions for the sake of it. Uh, chart out goal hierarchy, that's great. Yep, absolutely, it's a good thing to spend some time on. Setting calendar reminders, absolutely. I have reminders for everything on my calendar. I also use um, a to-do app with full of reminders just to keep me on track, remind me to do things that I'm supposed to be doing every day. Um, okay, great stuff. So let's just talk a little bit about what happens from here on out. You'll be starting hopefully to work towards your goals. You'll be taking those steps as you go. You'll be learning and you'll come, a point, uh, come to a point where either you realize that you're succeeding and things are going great or perhaps more likely you'll be struggling at some point. You'll find yourself up against the roadblock. And so this is where we have to make sure that our mindset stays in that growth state. So if you're struggling, then you know, watch for the words that you're using. Check for that fixed mindset. Uh, you know, look out for terms like, I can't do this, or yet, yeah, I'm terrible, or uh, I've never learned how to do this. I'm, I'm never going to figure it out. Watch for those words. Celebrate your effort. Don't focus so much on what you've achieved as an, as an outcome, but focus on the time and effort you've put in and focus on the, the wins that you've had along the way. Make a promise to yourself to persevere, to keep trying. Even if it means that you have to stop what you're doing today, promise yourself that you'll try again tomorrow, even if you really don't feel like it. Put it on your calendar, put it on your to-do list, try again the next day. Equally, if things are going well, then you still have to be, I would say, you still have to think about that. You still have to reflect on that. Acknowledge the fact that your growth mindset has led to your success. Again, still pay attention to the words you use. You'll probably find yourself using more confident terms like the ones we discussed, that you're going to continue, that you're going to keep trying, that you're going to keep putting the effort. You're going to celebrate the effort that you've put in more so than the results that you've achieved. You're still going to promise yourself to persevere because you know that at some point you're probably going to get stuck. And so you just have to promise yourself that you're going to keep going no matter what. Oops. And the thing that I think is really important, let me just bring this list up again, sorry about that, is that, I mean, if you notice, whether you're struggling or whether you're succeeding, both lists are kind of the same. And I think that for me is, is a really important point, that having that same attitude, the same energy, the same emotional consistency, regardless of things, whether things are going well or whether they're not going so well, I think is really important. And I, uh, I've heard about this in uh, sports coaching, particularly, you know, the, you'll hear about coaches, the ones that seem to have the most success or at least are the most respected in their profession are the ones that have the same kind of consistent attitude, regardless of whether the team is winning or losing. You know, the coaches that fly off the handle and start berating their players when things are going badly, but then are running up and down the sidelines cheering like a madman when things are going well, uh, maybe aren't as successful as the ones who are just a little bit more consistent. And so um, having that uh, even balance, regardless of what's going on, I think is, is a powerful, uh, powerful place to be in terms of succeeding. All right, so let's summarize. We've covered a lot in the last 45 minutes, an hour or so. So growth mindsets. Uh, well, a fixed mindset is one in which your traits, your fundamental skills, your intelligence, all those things are fixed. But with a growth mindset, you believe that those things are not fixed, that you can change them with effort over time. I encourage you to listen to the words that you use, particularly when you're struggling. Look out for those signs that you're in a fixed mindset and think about changing your words if you want to shift yourself into more of a growth mindset. You'll need grit. Grit is important in order to overcome the struggles that you will inevitably face and the way that you can get grit is to have goals with purpose. And the bigger the purpose, the bigger the why, the more the grittier you are likely to be. And you have to take steps every day towards your goals, whether things are going well or whether you're struggling, you have to promise that you will persevere and that you'll try again every day. And really you, you have to celebrate the efforts that you put in as much if not more so than the results that you achieve. 
Okay, so that is the end. Uh, if there are any more questions, I'm happy to take those now. I have a few minutes. I do have a hard stop at one o'clock, um, but if there are any questions in the last couple of minutes, I'm happy to take those now. Stuart, can you give us examples on how did you set up your calendar in achieving these things? I mean, uh, how I set up my calendar. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, I mean, technically it's a little bit complicated, but basically um, I have my to-do app linked to my calendar. Uh, and so whatever my, my tasks are for the day, I can actually arrange them on my calendar. So I have blocks of time set aside on my calendar to work on all the tasks that I have. Um, and for some of the big tasks that are gonna take a long time, like most of the day, um, sometimes I'll break those down into smaller tasks, but sometimes I, I kind of use that Pomodoro technique that I, that I mentioned um, to work in chunks towards um, getting those things. Um, the typical size of your done. one hour? Uh, it depends. Actually, I usually use like half an hour as sort of the smallest unit of time. Um, yeah, that seems to work pretty well for me. And the interval, is it weekly, daily? How do you... So the reason why I'm asking these questions is mm -hmm. uh, we are all excited about the seminar and we'll do something about this weekend. But how do we do the same thing six months from now? Yeah, so, I mean, it, it comes down to... Uh, Having, so yeah, that's a good question. In terms of like scheduling things and keeping on track with it, um, you know, you have your big goal and um, I don't know, this is a bit of a different subject, um, but there is uh, Tiago Forte who has done a lot of work on um, sort of like the concept of a second brain. And uh, in that you just kind of divide things into projects and areas and projects are things like goals, basically that you're trying to achieve. And areas are sort of overarching things that keep you, that, that, that allow you to um, keep track of things that don't necessarily have, you know, specific end dates. And so I have areas for the big things that um, I care about. So I have an area for, um, for Toastmasters, for example, I have an area for um, for learning, I have an area for, and I, in fact, I have areas for learning different things. Like um, right now I'm uh, going back into mathematics and learning about school modeling. And so I have an area for that. And then within that, I have a bunch of projects, which are specific things like um, watching a course on Coursera, which then spawns its own little set of tasks and projects within that. And I have a project uh, for reading a book on uh, quantifiable research. And I, so I have projects for those things. Um, and those projects are in an area. So like it's, it, it's tough because like none of that existed from the beginning, right? I just had a vague notion of where it was I wanted to be. And as I went along, I learned more. And at least my, my experience has been that I open, I pull on one little thread and a whole bunch of stuff unravels. And so it's like, you know, I crack open a book and I find there's way more in it than, than I can possibly digest at that moment. And so all of that then kind of goes into a list of things I want to learn about. And as I'm reading the book, there'll be references to other books and those go into the list. And so like I end up with this huge pile of things I want to dig into. Um, and that's kind of how it grows. And that then gives me a, enough fodder to keep working on things but it's every day or every week or once a month or once every few months. Um, I always have something in a list somewhere that it, that it refers to. I didn't explain that very well. I should probably sit down and think about that and write that down as a speech because that would help me organize my own thoughts on it. No, we are good. I got it. You have okay. daily goals, weekly goals, daily tasks, weekly tasks. And you even separated your tasks based on learning section, doing section, execution. Kind of. New things, yeah. old things, maintenance. Yeah. And uh, uh, actually, uh, that's a good point. There's an important part of my process is uh, reflecting. So I have uh, a to-do list in my to-do every day, do a, a daily reflection of the day. Every week, do a re daily reflection of the week. 
every month do a reflection of the month. And um, every quarter now I do a reflection of the quarter. How much time do you and spend so that's, reflection of the day? Reflection of the day? It's like five to 15 minutes. Depends on how different, you know, how many different things I've done that day. Um, and you add yeah, that to the I, calendar too. Uh, yeah, it's on my calendar. It's at five o'clock every day to write up my daily reflection. Yeah. Hi, Stuart. I have a question. This is Neha. Hi, Neha. Hey, uh, so, uh, like this presentation that I attended today from you, I have seen like some other people who do these evaluation workshops and some others. Uh, so, my one question to all of you is that right now you are doing this for free right like it's a giving kind of a thing you want people to know this so right now do you also have something of a uh, like a money goal to it like eventually i want to be doing this as full time and like this, do you know at this that this is at this time that this is your calling like someone was talking about like this is your passion that you want to educate people you want to motivate people and eventually you want to leave your job and make this a full-time thing so that you invest your hundred percent of the time in this thing and this is your career this becomes your career so do you know that at this time or is it just a giveaway kind of a thing and i'll just keep doing it like uh, this forever yeah uh no i don't know that but the, I, maybe part of your question is um do I have a goal around doing these sorts of workshops? And the answer is yes, absolutely I do. And yeah, part of that is exploring the question of what might it be like if I was to do this full time? Or what might it be like if I turn this into some kind of uh, consultancy practice? Or what might it be like? So these are questions that I have. And this doing this is part of answering those questions. Um, but it also does, a big part of the reason why I do this um, is for my own understanding. You know, there's that uh, saying that, you know, before you can understand, you, you know, once you, you can only, you know, you understood something if you can teach it to someone else. And so doing these workshops for me forces me to think about what I know and what I don't know. And so I like doing them as a way just to really solidify my own knowledge on a subject and to find out the areas where I need to uh, keep learning and where the, I have gaps in my knowledge. And so um, that's actually really the motivation for it. That's the, you know, my hierarchy of goals. That's what it fits into. But, you know, it's possible that it could also lead to something else one day. I think that's an interesting question to answer. When you first started, did you have that end in mind or at all? Like even 1%? Did you have that end in mind? Um, I had, yes, the question was there from the beginning, sure. Okay. But it, it, the, the goal wasn't there. The goal, I mean, the goal isn't there right now of becoming a full-time professional speaker or coach or trainer. Um, the goal is to, I suppose, find out if that's something that I want to get into. That's really what that goal is. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Yeah, this is Ming. I have another question. Maybe that's my last question. I'd like you to help me to have a growth mindset because when I hear your speech, it's really inspiring. At the same time, I feel like it's very exhausting to living a life like that. You know, it's too, how can okay. I change my mindset of growth mindset actually really, really be happy doing all these things? I just, the thought about it, doing everything every day like this, just really exhausting. Probably that's called grit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, grit is, is a muscle, right? And like the more you do it, the stronger you get at it. Um, I might argue that having a fixed mindset is actually more exhausting and more tiring um, because it means that you're always searching for something, right? That's one of the things that I learned um, early on kind of in my own discovery process is that I was spending a lot of time looking for validation, looking to uncover things, my, my talents effectively, like trying to find out the things that I was good at in life. Um, and I have a, a lot of, thoughts as to why that's the case. I think actually the education system that I grew up in, in the UK, is geared exactly towards that. It's designed to force you or focus you into a fairly narrow path of things that you're good at. Um, and when you grow up in that environment, at least for me, when I grew up in that environment, I think it led me to a place where 
that's all I was interested in. I was only interested in finding out what I was good at. And therefore, if I wasn't immediately, if it wasn't immediately obvious that I was good at something, I'd just give up on it and I'd just stop. Um, and that kind of, uh, maybe that's not such a terrible thing if it's done uh, in a controlled and uh, uh, purposeful way, but at least the way it affected me was not that way. And so I spent a lot of my time trying to find things that I was good at and that takes a lot of effort and it's very frustrating when you try something you figure out that it that, that you can't do it very well and then you go on to the next thing you just keep going around and going around and going around and so that for me was more exhausting than having um, a growth mindset where i am more purposeful in achieving my goals um, because i'm much more excited about achieving my goals than i am about trying to find a new thing that i can say that i'm good at that's my experience so thank you so much, Stuart. I know you have a hard stop at one o'clock, but uh, on on behalf of uh, all the thirty people in the in the Zoom meeting, I would really like to appreciate and thank you. And I want to let you know there are around more than two hundred comments around, and I haven't seen those many ever. Thank you so much. <laughs>